G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Hebrews. As it is the first session, this will be the introduction. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and it will help you in your Christian growth. Thank you. Now, there are some rules of interpretation before we study any book of the Bible. Uh, we have, first up, we have the golden rule of interpretation, which says that when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every, every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths tell us otherwise. So there, this applies to prophetic and non-prophetic books, not just to some books. So every time we sit down to read a passage of scripture, this should be remembered. Uh, the Bible should be approached with the assumption that this book can be understood just like any other book that is taken literally. This rule becomes the foundation for the other three rules. The second law or the second rule is called the law of double reference. And this law observes the fact that often a passage or a block of scripture is speaking of two different persons or two different events that are separated by a long period of time and in which they're, they're blended into, into one picture. An example of this is, is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, for instance. Verses 1 to 2 speak of the first coming, while verses 3 to 5 speak of the second coming. Again, the two of them are blended into one picture with no indication that there's a gap of time between the two. So that's the law of double reference. Third law is the law of recurrence. And this law describes the fact that in some passages of Scripture, there exists the recording of an event followed by a second recording of the same event, and that gives us more details to the first. So what we have is we, it involves two blocks of Scripture. The first block would represent, uh, uh, represent an event as it transpires in, in chronological sequence, and this is followed by a second block of Scripture dealing with the same event and the same period of time, but giving no further details as to what transpires in the course of the event. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 uh, verses 1 to 23 gives a complete picture. This is an example. gives a complete picture of the invasion of Israel from the north and then the subsequent destruction of the invading army. And this is then followed by the second block of scripture, Ezekiel 39, 1 to 16, which repeats some of the account given in the first block of scripture, but it gives some more added details regarding the destruction of the invading army. Now, the fourth law is the law of context, which states a text apart from its context is a pretext. A verse can only mean what it means in its context, and we cannot take it out of its context. Whenever it's taken out of its context, it's often presented as meaning something that it cannot mean within the context in which it was written. A good example of this is uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And this verse is often used as a prophecy of the Messiah. If you pull it out of its context, it does really sound like it could be Jesus. But the context, which is Zechariah 13, verses 2 to 6, is speaking of false prophets. So verse 6 cannot refer to Jesus unless Jesus is taken to be a false prophet. So this is the danger of studying a verse by itself rather than in its context. And the common saying, you can prove anything by the Bible, is only true when this law, the law of context, is violated. So these are the four basic rules which, if followed, will help in the study of the scripture, both in general and in prophecy in particular. So these principles of interpretation should be applied uh, consistently to the whole Bible. The, these, are, these four rules were formulated by Dr. David L. Cooper. Uh, he's the late founder and director of the Biblical Research Society. Okay, now, of the 21 epistles in the New Testament, five of them were written to Jewish believers dealing with 
with the needs of Jewish believers and specific issues that Jewish believers faced. Now, there are things in these epistles which are applicable to all believers, but some are true only of Jewish believers. And these five epistles are Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude. Now, first century Messianic community was faced with two major problems. They had persecution and false doctrine. And persecution took place both within the land of Israel and also among the Jewish believers of the diaspora. Uh, when we speak of diaspora, diaspora, uh, diaspora is simply a, a, it's a technical term for Jews who live outside the land of Israel. So to deal with the problem of persecution in the land of Israel, the book of Hebrews was written. To deal with the persecution in the diaspora, the dispersion, uh, those living outside the land, the epistles of James and 1 Peter were written. The book of Hebrews was written by someone in the diaspora outside the land to believers in Israel. James was written by someone in Israel to Jewish believers in the diaspora, in the dispersion. 1 Peter was written by someone in one part of the diaspora to Jewish believers in another part of the diaspora. Now, to deal with the second problem, false doctrine, two other epistles were written, and that's 2 Peter and the book of Jude. 2 Peter was written from one part of the diaspora to Jewish believers in another part of the diaspora. And Jude was written from the land, from Israel, to Jewish believers <coughs> who were living in the diaspora. Now, the author, well, the author is unknown, but we do have some suggestions, uh, lots of suggestions. Uh, some say Paul or Barnabas or Apollos, Clement of Rome. However, uh, Clement of Rome doesn't make any mention of it in, in his own letters. And we had Luke, Silas, Philip, John, Mark, and Aristion. Uh, that's the short list. You can add some more names to that. Uh, one writer argues strenuously that it was Priscilla who wrote the epistle, but uh, we, we, we find in Hebrews 11.32 that this is negated because uh, there the author uses a masculine participle to describe himself, so it, it wouldn't be Priscilla who was female. We simply don't know who the author is. We, don't know, we can't determine who the author was. Now, while it is unknown who the author is, two things we do know about the author. First of all, the author was a Jew because it was to Jews that the oracles of God were committed. And we see that in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. Also, the author had special intimate knowledge of Judaism that only a Jewish person would have. Not only was the author Jewish, he was also a Jewish believer in Jesus, in Messiah, and he was known by the readers Second thing we know about the author is that we find in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, the author indicates he was a second generation Jewish believer, meaning that he was not an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus. And so he excludes himself from being among the apostles who were eyewitnesses, uh, which may indicate that Paul was not the author. However, if this statement only refers to the 12 apostles, well, it would not exclude Paul because he wasn't among the 12. There are seven things about the readers that can be deduced from the epistle. First of all, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, they, like the author, were also second generation believers. So the readers and the author are united by the word us, in verse 3, and distinguished from those who were eyewitnesses. Second, the readers were Jewish. Why? Because the readers are, uh, were very respectful of Old Testament authority, and that's why the writer heavily quotes the Old Testament. So the, old, the, quotes from the quotations from the Old Testament settles the argument, which indeed it would do for a Jewish audience. The Gentiles wouldn't be that fussed about the Old Testament authority. Third, uh, the readers were Jewish believers, 
And uh, the main danger the author warns against is that of going back into Judaism. Now, this would not have been a temptation for Gentile believers. Uh, the entire backdrop and frame of reference from which the author writes are Jewish history and the Jewish religion. Now, some commentators believe the people in the audience to whom the author is writing are not believers uh, because of statements he makes uh, throughout the epistle, but he clearly treats them as believers. For example, in chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 12, he calls them brethren. In chapter 6, verse 9, beloved. In 3, verse 1, they are partakers of the heavenly calling, which is unique to believers only. In 3.14, they are partakers of Christ or the Messiah. And finally, certain warnings such as a falling away due to an evil heart of unbelief and a hardening by the deceitfulness of sin, which we find in chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, would only be applicable if the readers are believers. The so-called so problem passages that we have in Hebrews can be dealt with uh, in a way other than assuming that they were not believers. Fourth thing we know about these, the readers, we see in chapter 5, verse 12, and that is that, that the readers have been believers for a long time, and they should now be teachers of the word. And we see that passage there in chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Fifth thing we know, although they have been believers for a long time, they have remained spiritually immature, and they have not progressed in the faith. Again, uh, that chapter 5, verses 11 to 14 tells us that. The sixth thing we know is that the readers are now wavering in their faith because of persecution. Again, we find that in chapter 10, verses 32 to 38. The seventh thing we do know is that there are readers who know the author. And, and we see that in chapter 13, verses 19 and 23. Now, where, where are they? There are many suggestions as to where the recipients of the epistles were residing as they're about, uh, about who authored it. So uh, again, these suggestions include Jerusalem, Caesarea, Samaria, Antioch, Lysias, the Valley of Colossae, um, uh, which is Lys Lycus Valley. Um, we have Cyprus, we have Galatia, Perea, Corinth, Ephesus, Alexandria, and Rome, among other locations that are mentioned. Uh, nevertheless, only really only three of these have any uh, possible validity. <clears throat> and that would be uh, Jerusalem, Rome, and Judea, which is outside of Jerusalem. Now, the first suggestion is that it was written to believers residing in Jerusalem. And there are three reasons why we can reject this view. First of all, in chapters two, in chapter two, verses three to four, the readers did not personally hear Jesus speak. But it is very unlikely that there were persons within the church of Jerusalem who had not heard Jesus speak. The second thing here is that the readers are known for their charity. And when we see that in chapter 6, verse 10, also chapter 10, verse 34, but the church of Jerusalem was known for its poverty. Remember that the, the church of Jerusalem in, in Acts sold up everything that they had and gave to the poor. Now, churches around the ancient world were sending contributions to the church in Jerusalem. And, and again, we find that in Acts chapter 11, verse 29. Romans 15, 25 to 27, and 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 8. The third thing we know here about uh, uh, being not Jerusalem is that the author mentions here that none of the readers have suffered martyrdom. And that we find in chapter 12, verse 4 of Hebrews. But this wasn't true of the church of Jerusalem because Jerusalem lost Stephen we find in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 to 60, also lost James the Apostle in Acts 12, verse 2, and James the brother of Jesus, who had been killed by the time this book was written. A second suggestion is that the readers were Jewish believers residing in Rome. 
but there are two reasons we can uh, discard this suggestion. First of all, according to uh, Hebrews 2 verses 3 to 4, these believers were evangelized by eyewitnesses of Jesus who heard him speak and saw his works. However, the church of Rome was not evangelized by eyewitnesses. In Romans chapter 1 verses 1 to 14 and Romans 15 verse 20, Paul writes that the church of Rome was not established by an apostle. Therefore, if he came to Rome, he would not be building on another man's or, an, or another apostle's foundation. That's what Paul said. Second, the Jewish believers to whom he wrote felt a very strong pull to return to the sacrificial system, the Judaism of the day. So now this would not be true of, believe, of Jews who were living in Rome who lived too far away from Jerusalem uh, to be tempted to so strongly to return to the sacrificial system of Jerusalem. So that we, we can rule Rome out for that reason. Now, the third suggestion is the best one. <clears throat> so this letter was written to Jewish believers of the churches of Judea. And we find, we, we, if we have a look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 22, we see that uh, we can surmise this from that. Uh, and uh, here, Judea, as I said, was located outside of Jerusalem. So these believers were undergoing uh, tremendous persecution, short of martyrdom, at the time the letter was written. Nevertheless, they were residing close enough to Jerusalem that there was a great incentive for them to go back into the entire sacrificial system. Now, when was it written? There, there is no date given, but we can narrow it down to a, a period of time. First of all, uh, one of the early church fathers, Clement of Rome, he wrote letters in AD 96 in which he quoted from the book of Hebrews. Uh, so what does this mean? It means or it shows that this letter was written sometime before AD 96 when Clement wrote his letters. Second, uh, we see in uh, chapter 13, verse 23, that the author mentions Timothy. Now, this shows that the book had to be written after AD 50 because that was the year that Paul led Timothy to the Lord. And you can find it in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Now, the third thing about the dating, uh, it was written before Timothy died uh, because the writer talks about Timothy in the present tense in chapter 13, verse 23. So Timothy was still alive when this letter was written. And the fourth thing, according to the book of Hebrews, the recipients were second generation believers. And we see that in, Act, in chapter two, verse three. And they have been believers long enough to be teachers. We see that in chapter five, verses, one to, uh, verses 11 to 14. So it also had to be prior to 70 AD since the temple functions are described in the present tense uh, in the book of Hebrews, and they were seen as still functioning. And, and we see this uh, when the author writes uh, of the sacrificial system, he uses the present tense. We see that in chapter 7, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 4, chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 11, chapter 10, verse 8. And also we see it further on in 13, 10, 13, 11. Um, so it, it's, it's interspersed throughout the book of Hebrews that he's writing in, in, uh, in the present tense because the temple was still functioning. Therefore, it had to be before 70 AD when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. Now, the sixth thing regarding the date, we know that in in, in chapter 3, verse 17, the author implies that it has been almost 40 years since the crucifixion, uh, and that occurred in AD 30. Seventh, in chapter 12, verses 26 to 29, he makes statements about a shaking in the land, uh, which had already begun, and he implies here that the seeds of the Jewish revolt were being sown. So there was a, a, a bit of a rumbling within the land when he, when he wrote this letter. Now, uh, the revolt began in AD 66. That's when uh, uh, the Jews started revolting against the Romans. 
but there was a two year prelude during which there were a series of attacks against uh, uh, from against the Jews from AD 66. Um, so uh, there was obviously rumblings before. So if we bang all these clues together, we find that the book was probably written somewhere between AD 64 and AD 66. So the seeds of the Jewish revolt were beginning during these years, but the full scale full-scale revolt had not yet begun. Now, the author of, of Hebrews, he, he builds his case on a number of theological examples from the Old Testament. From the book of Genesis, he chooses Esau as an example of a man who made an irrevocable decision. And once having made it, there was no turning back. Um, and instead, Esau actually lost out on temporal blessings and uh, no amount of, of tears or remorse on the part of Esau could change history. And that's when he sold his birthright. By the same token, we're going to find that the readers of the, uh, the book of, of, of the epistle of Hebrews are now also in danger of making an irrevocable decision. And if they make it, there'll be no turning back for them either. They will be subject to divine discipline in this life and loss of reward in the next one. Uh, and that's from the book of Genesis. Now, from the book of, e, uh, from the book of Exodus, uh, the author selects two items as examples. He selects the tabernacle and the priesthood. Uh, from the tabernacle, he draws a lesson from the means of access to God. And from the priesthood, he derives a concept of a mediator between God and man. So there's Genesis, there's Exodus. Uh, we move to Leviticus. And the author picks out two examples from the book of Leviticus. And he looks at the blood sacrifices of chapters 1 to 7 and the Day of Atonement of chapter 16. Now, from chapters 1 to 7, he teaches animal blood only covered sin. It did not take away sin. Animal blood only accomplished ritual cleansing. And then he moves to chapter 16 and he points out that this uh, um, day of atonement, it was a day of national atonement. And the sin sacrifice for the occasion was unique in that the priest could not partake of this sin sacrifice, although he could partake of all the other sin sacrifices. The portion of the Day of Atonement sacrifice that was not burned on the altar was taken outside the camp and it was burned outside the camp. Now, we're going to see that the author would make a comparison between burning the sacrifice outside the camp to the crucifixion of Jesus outside the gate. Now, from the book of Numbers, he again picks out two examples or two items as examples. And the first item is the description of Moses, which we see in chapter 12 of Numbers. Moses was faithful, but the Messiah is greater in faithfulness than Moses. A one-time defection took place on the faithful Moses, which we see in chapter 14 of Numbers. Now that a greater than Moses had come, will there be another defection? That's, that's what the, the, the author would be posing. The second item the author takes from the book of Numbers is the sin of Kadesh Barnea, which we find in chapters 13, 14. Uh, chapters 13 and 14. And that, again, here too, the issue is the issue is making an irrevocable decision. Israel, they'd finally arrived at the border of the promised land. They were there. They could look across the, the Jordan, see the promised land. And from that oasis, Moses sent out 12 spies who came back 40 days later. They all agreed on one thing. The land was all that God said it was, a land flowing with milk and honey. The spies then came back to a crucial point of disagreement. Only two of the 12 spies believed that the land could be taken with the help of God. 
The other 10 declared that due to the, you know, the, the numerical superiority and the military might of the Canaanites, there was no possibility of taking the land. Now, these people had made a, a very common mistake of believing that the majority was always right. And what did they do? They rebelled against the authority of Moses and Aaron. The two were almost killed by the mob before God intervened. That was the Israelites' 10th act of rebellion since the Exodus began. And at that point, God proclaimed judgment on the Exodus generation. And God decreed that they would not enter the promised land, but would wander in the desert until 40 years passed. And during that time, all who came out of Egypt would die except for the two righteous spies and those Israelites who were presently younger than the age of 20. So the Exodus generation reached the point of no return. They had made an irrevocable decision and they lost out on the blessing of the promised land. Now, remember that Israel is God's covenant nation. And in God's, covenant, in God's dealings with his covenant nation, once a generation reaches a point of no return and they make an irrevocable decision, no amount of repentance can change the fact of coming physical judgment. In fact, uh, the passage in, in, uh, in Numbers states the people repented uh, and Numbers 14 verse 20 states that God forgave their sins. So this did not affect anyone's individual salvation, but they still had to pay the physical consequence of their irrevocable decision. And the physical consequence was physical death outside the land. And thus the promised land was withdrawn from the Exodus generation and was later reoffered to the wilderness generation. So the consequences of their irrevocable decision did not mean they had to return to Egypt and become slaves again. That's not what happened. They remained a physically redeemed people, but it meant they would not progress to the promised land until that generation, uh, which rejected the, the two spies and rejected God, died off. They were on a divine discipline, and it resulted in their physical death outside the land and the application to the readers to the guys who are reading this this uh, epistle to the hebrews is that they too are in danger of making an irrevocable decision now remember it does not mean they're in danger of losing their salvation it does mean that they are in danger of failing to progress to spiritual maturity which in turn will bring on divine physical discipline in this life and loss of reward for the messianic kingdom. Now the author, uh, sorry, another key example taken from the Old Testament is a man called Melchizedek. And the author is going to build a large theological comparison uh, based on the very limited amount of information about Melchizedek, which we find in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20 and the prophecy found in Psalm 110, verse 4. Uh, and the prophecy says that the Messiah will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The law of Moses uh, is, another, um, is another example the author uses as a background. Uh, and the main thing he notes is the fact that while there were blood sacrifices for some sins, there were no sacrifices available for others. Uh, and so for certain sins, uh, there was only physical death, no sacrifice available. The last item used from the Old Testament is the distinction between the prophets, uh, the, thing, the distinction that uh, um, uh, the prophets made between uh, the remnant and the non-remnant, the remnant and the non-remnant. In the Old Testament, um, the two groups were distinguished from one another in that the remnant actually 
believed what God had revealed through Moses and the prophets, but the non-remnant did not believe and they pursued idolatry. Now in the New Testament, the point of division was that the remnant believed in the messiahship of Jesus, but the non-remnant rejected him. And what we know from this epistle, what we've even looked, just looked at so far, is that the readers of the epistles were members of the remnant of that day. Now, the key passage to understanding the issue in the book of Hebrews is Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 45. Now, this chapter, this chapter 12 of Matthew records the account of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and the unpardonable sin. And in this passage, Matthew 12, the leadership of Israel rejected the messiahship of Jesus on the basis of his being demon-possessed. And at that point, Jesus withdrew the offer of the messianic kingdom from that generation and declared that they were now under a divine judgment. For the Jewish generation of Jesus' day, that was their irrevocable decision. Judgment was now inevitable because this sin was what Jesus called it unpardonable. No matter how many Jews came to believe, and, and, and myriads did, it would not change the fact of coming judgment. The Jewish believers to whom the author was writing were members of that same generation that was guilty of the unpardonable sin, and they were facing the coming judgment of AD 70. And similar to Kadesh Barnea, where when the offer of the land was withdrawn from the Exodus generation, so too the offer of the kingdom, the messianic kingdom, or of Gentiles known as the millennial kingdom, was withdrawn from the generation of Jesus' day. As the land was re-offered to the next generation, the wilderness generation uh, that accepted it, by the same token, the kingdom will be re-offered to a future generation that will accept it. And this will be the generation living in the great tribulation, and you can check that out in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. This divine judgment was a physical judgment of destruction fulfilled by the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. By way of definition, just so that we know what the unpardonable sin is, the unpardonable sin is the national rejection by Israel of the Messiahship of Jesus while he was present on the grounds of his being demon possessed. Now, in light of, of the nature of the unpardonable sin and the judgment on the generation of Jesus' day, and the, the, the fact that the unpardonable sin was a national sin, it was not an individual sin, it was a national sin specific to the generation of Jesus' day that rejected him while he was physically present. So it's not individual. So individuals came to faith in Jesus. For instance, Paul, he was a Jew, came to faith after. So the message to that generation is the message of Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. Peter is speaking here and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, in order to escape the judgment on that generation, individual Jews had to do two things. First, they had to repent. Now, it's a Greek word that means to change your mind. They had to change their mind about what? They had to change their minds about Jesus. The generation of Jesus' day believed Jesus was demon-possessed. That's what they were told by their leaders, and that's what they accepted, and that's what they even declared themselves later on. The readers uh, the, the, of Hebrews needed to change their minds or repent, believe that Jesus was the Messiah or is the Messiah. 
And this act of repentance or change of mind would lead to their spiritual salvation. So that's in the book of Acts. That's the example in the book of Acts. However, they've come to faith in Jesus. Yes, they've done that. They've repented. They believe that he's the Messiah. Uh, he's not demon possessed at all. But that alone is not going to save them physically from the coming judgment. In order to be saved physically from the judgment, they would have to be baptized. Now, baptism would separate them from the generation and the Judaism that rejected the Messiah. The act of baptism would save them physically. So Peter declares, save yourselves. Now, obviously no one can save themselves spiritually. Therefore, from what are they to save themselves? Peter continues, he says, from this crooked generation. So what Peter is saying is that they need to save themselves physically from the generation that rejected or declared that Jesus was demon possessed. And water baptism is what will save them physically from this crooked generation. And that in turn will save them physically from the judgment of the unpardonable sin. Now, Uh, just, just, just quickly, um, the idea of baptism. Uh, baptism uh, means to, uh, to, the purpose of baptism is to identify yourself with either a person or a group. So what, uh, what they were, were being called to do was to now, uh, you've placed your faith in Messiah Jesus to save you from the penalty of your sins. Now you need to be baptized to now identify yourself with him and his movement. And by doing that, you're now disassociating yourself from what you previously were. And that's the purpose of baptism. It's to identify yourself with a, a, a group or, or a person. Now, the overall context of Hebrews is dealing with Jewish believers who were undergoing tremendous, severe persecution. And because of this persecution, they were seriously considering going back into Judaism. But that was not the totality of their thinking. As we're going to see as we go through the book of Hebrews, they thought they could temporarily lay aside their salvation, go back into Judaism until the persecution subsided. And they believed that, okay, once the persecutions died down, uh, and then we can be saved again later. That's what they believed. And they believed that this new salvation would then erase the sin of their earlier apostasy and they could start their spiritual lives all over again. Now, this is the option they thought they had. But the author of the epistle is going to point out that they do not have this option. It's not one of their options. They do have two options. But starting their spiritual lives anew is not one of the options because that would require a re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that's not going to happen. The writer wants to warn the readers against going back into Judaism. And the Judaism warned against includes the Judaism of the Levitical system, rabbinic Judaism, and the Judaism that rejected the Messiahship of Jesus. And the writer is now writing within the context of this coming judgment of AD 70, which was a judgment for the unpardonable sin. This was a national sin, not an individual one, and it is applicable only to the Jewish generation of Jesus' day, not to any subsequent generations, Jewish generations. The judgment of the unpardonable sin was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the worldwide dispersion of the Jewish people. And the writer's warning is this. If the readers go back into Judaism now, they're going to re-identify themselves with the generation guilty of the unpardonable sin and will place themselves back under the judgment of AD 70. And when the judgment strikes, they will die a physical death as 
a divine discipline. Yeah, the only way they have of escaping the coming 70 AD judgment, the judgment of the unpalatable sin, is to make their break from Judaism once and for all complete. And for Jews of that day, as well as Jews for today, the complete break from Judaism comes by water baptism. Unless they undergo the water baptism, they'll be included in the 70 AD judgment. So the writer, the writer, oh, sorry, you need to come to faith first and then you become water baptized. Okay. So the writer is dealing with a physical judgment here. And this book is being written to Jewish believers still living before the AD 70 judgment. And they can escape the coming judgment or they can fall prey to it. They got two choices. Choices is. And the writer warns them because they'll suffer intense consequences if they do not repent. Change their mind. You can't go back into Judaism and escape persecution. Now, there are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews, and they're often used to teach the loss of salvation. But that is not what they're about. These passages are always dealing with physical death. The readers are encouraged to change their mind about returning to Judaism and thus escape the judgment. Now, on the positive side, they are encouraged to press on to spiritual maturity. And we see that in chapter 5, verses uh, 11 to 14, and chapter 10, verses 33 to 39. At the same time, the writer wanted to combat the danger of apostasy, uh, which we'll see in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and chapter 10, 19 to 25. And he also comforts and encourages them in their present persecutions, which we'll see from chapter 11, verse 1 to chapter 12, verse 13. Now, the author's method was to show the superiority of the Messiah over the system of Judaism. So that which they have in the Messiah supersedes what they had in, Jude in Judaism. So the contrast here is not between what is good and bad, because the whole sacrificial system was given by God. And so it was good. It was holy. The contrast here is between that which is good and that which is better. Biblical Judaism was good, but Messiah is better. Now, as the author expounds on the good and the better, he's going to take the three main pillars of the Judaism of that day. Angels, Moses, and the Levitical priesthood. And he's going to show that what the readers now have in the Messiah is superior to all three pillars of Judaism. The author of Hebrews basically gives a very logical and theological development of the material. But five different times he deviates from his logical development to give these warnings. And the warning is always going to be based upon what he's just said. And some people believe um, a believer can lose his salvation because of what the author said in these five warnings. Now, this belief is due to your, is due to your, is due to a failure to realize that in the Jewish usage of the terms save and salvation, the terms are not always used in a spiritual sense. In fact, more frequently, they're used of physical salvation. And it is because of these five warnings that some teach it is possible to lose one's salvation. Now, others who do not believe in the possibility of losing one's salvation, that what they do is they teach the book of Hebrews was not written to believers. They teach it was written to people who had come very close to believing, yet had never made the choice to trust in the Messiah. Now, if we understand that the Jewish usage of save and saving can mean either the physical or the spiritual, uh, that will clarify what these five warnings are about. We'll be able to see them pretty, cl pretty uh, clearly. The warnings all have to do with physical judgments. Every example and comparison the writer uses from the Old Testament deals with a physical judgment and a physical death, not spiritual. 
The warning passages we're going to see are warnings about drifting in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, disobedience in chapter 3, 7 to chapter 4, 13, immaturity, 5, 11 to 6, 20, willful sin, 10, 19 to 31, and indifference, chapter 12, 25 to 29. So the judgments are physical, not spiritual. And although the author gives the readers warnings and theological discourses, he also comforts and encourages them in their present persecution, which we see in uh, 11, uh, 1 to 12, 13. The readers have this great cloud of witnesses to help them through this persecution. And uh, we know that the Lord chastens his sons, but the end result will be peaceable fruit. So through faith, these guys can run the race before them with patience. Now, there are five key words in the epistle. One is perfection. Uh, this is not meaning sinlessness, but meaning maturity in contrast to immaturity. See that in 2, 10, 5, 9, 6, 1, 7, 11, 19, and 28, chapter 10, verse 14, chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Now, this perfection could never, ever be accomplished by the Levitical priesthood. And Hebrews 7.11 will tell us that. Or it could not be achieved by the law, Hebrews 7.19 tells us. Nor could the blood of animal sacrifices achieve it, Hebrews 10 verse 1. Now, Jesus Christ gave himself as one offering for sin. And by this, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14. Second key word is eternal in contrast to what was temporal, uh, such as the Mosaic law, the sacrifices, the Aaronic priesthood, and, and, and so on. Uh, and we see that in chapter 5, verse 9, chapter 6, 2, 9, 12, uh, 14 to 15, and chapter 13, verse 20. The other word, uh, which, is, uh, which is forever, it's a corollary, uh, corollary to eternal, and uh, we see that in 1, 8, 5, 6, 6, 20, 7, 14, and 26, 8, 1, 9, 24, 12, 25, to 26. Now, we see that Christ is the author of eternal salvation. There's that word eternal. Chapter 5, verse 9. And through his death, he obtained eternal redemption. Chapter 9, verse 12. And he shares with believers the promise of eternal inheritance 9 15 we see his throne is forever hebrews 1 8 and he's a priest forever hebrews 5 6 6 20 7 17 and 21 and jesus christ is the same yesterday and today and forever hebrews 13 8 now the third uh, key word fourth key word fourth key word is heavenly in contrast to what is earthly earthly and heavenly now uh, we see this in uh, 3 1 6 4 8 5 9 23 11 16 and 12 22 the next word is the word better in contrast to what is good um, and uh, christ we see is better than the angels he's not an angel he's better than the angels and we see that in hebrews 1 4 he brought in a better hope in Hebrews 7, 19, because he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises, Hebrews 8, 6. So when you combine these words, you discover that Jesus Christ and the Christian life that he gives us are better or is better because these blessings are eternal and they give us a perfect standing before God. Religious system under the Mosaic law was imperfect because it could not accomplish a once for all redemption that was eternal. But Jesus' death did. Now, the first main division in the book is from chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 10, verse 18. And that focuses on the preeminence of the Son in his person and work. And this section is primarily theological with a little bit of application. And it, it is in this section that the author shows the Messiah is superior to the three pillars of Judaism, 
angels, Moses, and the Levitical priesthood. The second main division, which is chapter 10, 19 to chapter 13, verse 25, that focuses on the practical application of the preeminence of the Son in the walk of the believer. Now, this section is primarily application with a little bit of theology in it. In other words, what the writer does is after showing the superior, superiority of the Messiah to the three pillars uh, of Judaism in the first section, he then goes on to answer what difference does it make? What difference does it make? Now, the theme of the book uh, is the superiority of the sun. Now, that's where we leave it for this session. Uh, there are contact details there, and uh, we'll delve into the book in the next section. Thank you for coming along. I pray that this will benefit you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you.